Hey there, Lincoln Riffers! I'm both excited and ecstatic to present to you my interview with Greg Howe. Greg Howe is a true modern guitar hero. Not only did Greg Howe produce a new sound and a new approach to creating music with the electric guitar, he also invented many of the techniques that are used by modern electric guitar players. Greg Howe is a true guitar legend and I think that you'll find this interview I opening because uh, we are going through a kind of a journey. It was meant to be a 30 minute uh, interview but it became an hour-long interview um, and you you get everything from his beginnings as a guitar player, how he found uh, his passion for guitar and I think that most of you would be able to relate to his story of how he started out as a guitar player and then we talk about his techniques and his approaches and his sounds and we go into more elaborate ideas and more advanced concepts so it's, it's an interview you, but it's also a journey so um, I'm honored and um, I thank Greg Howe for this interview and now without further ado Greg Howe. Good. Nice. How are you? How are you doing? Fine. How are you? Doing great. It's uh, so awesome to talk to you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. No, no. I must argue with that. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. Uh, so shall we start? Sure. Absolutely. Okay, so um, all right, I'll um, I'll cut right here and I'll start here. And it looks okay. Is it? If you can see here. Uh, just yeah. my guitar. In case yeah. I I, demonstrate yeah, anything. I can see everything. I can. I can. I can hear it just fine. Everything. Yeah. Excellent. Very cool. Right. So first of all, uh, thank you for doing this. My uh, pleasure. I really appreciate this. Um, okay, so I'll just uh, do a little intro and we'll start. Hey there, Lincoln Riffers. Uh, I hope you recognize the man I'm about to interview. And if uh, you don't recognize him, then uh, you should. Because Greg Howe is, first of all, he's my absolute favorite guitar player. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's him and John Schofield. Yeah, it's, it's just... Uh, I can't begin to describe Greg's uh, playing because um, his playing is so original. It's not just, um, well, it, just go and listen to, to him and come back and watch this interview because uh, there are no superlatives in the English language enough to describe Greg's music. It's, <laughs> it's, it's so groovy. It's so original. It's so um, whimsical. His playing is so whimsical, and uh, just just look at his fingers. Just look at him play. Uh, <laughs> you you can't even hear anything, and 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 you know that the guy is having the time of his life playing the guitar. Uh, so hi, hello. Good to see you, man. I, I don't even I I, I feel like uh, you know when when intros are that flattering, I just kind of want to run and hide in the corner somewhere. And, and uh, <laughs> but thank you for that. that, that Really appreciate it. Very much appreciate that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean every word. Uh, I've been listening to you since I was in high school. Oh, really? And, cool. Yeah, and even though even though I'm uh, I'm a finger style acoustic player, um, your your playing has such a unique rhythmical and and melodic approach. Yeah. And I I was wondering. It, it's been it's been on my mind for years. How how did you develop? You, uh, your signature techniques. How how did you come about it? I mean, my my guess, mm -hmm. um, my guess is that um, I mean, you you when you play, it looks so effortless. You can you can play like a, a, a thousand notes a minute, but it it seems so effortless. It seems like you're enjoying it and, and you're you're in the moment. You don't care about anything other than the music, other than the, the music that you're that you're making in the moment. And I was wondering how. How did you reach this um, this Zen like place where you where you can be fast, precise, ex you know, expressive, melodic? Because uh, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, you're probably one of a handful of guitar players with lighting quick technique that can also 
be melodic when you play at that speed. I see. And, and I just don't get how, I mean, I can improvise finger style pieces and, and people think that I'm making magic, but I can break it down. But, but when I look at you play, I can see, I can see the, the logic behind it, but I just can't understand how in the world you can be so melodic while being so fast. <laughs> oh man, it's a, you know, I, first of all, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you hear it that way. It's, it's really interesting when I'm, when I, uh, when I do interviews sometimes like this in that, um, you know, people are pointing out things that from their perspective, seem to be a certain way and it's hard because like for instance if you say um how does this happen and how does it look how does it seem to be so easy I, none of it really feels that easy uh to me yeah so, <laughs> so um my goal has always been to I, i mean i guess really the easiest way for me to talk about it is is really just to, to give you my perspective because I really do hear myself differently than other people hear me. Okay. I, I have a good friend who, uh, he's not a, only a good friend, but he actually is a really big fan. And we became friends because, partially because um, he was a fan and then, then we had a legitimate friendship that developed. But he's always reminding me that, you know, uh, I don't think you hear, he's, he always says to me, Greg, I don't think that you hear the things that your fans are really hearing about you. I think that you are so used to yourself that you're not recognizing the things that uh, are feeling unique to them right? you know yeah. or sometimes so sometimes it's tough because when i hear guitar players if i listen to steve ray on or alan holdsworth i'm just like oh, my god this is god i can't you know wish i could be like that but um yeah we all wish we could be alan holdsworth yeah is right <laughs> exactly but um you know when i started playing the guitar I um, was doing it really for fun I was in I was young as a matter of fact I was I wanted to learn how to play the guitar when I was very young simply because I wanted to know how to have chords behind us if, if me and my brother were singing mm -hmm. pretending to be the Beatles or pretending to be uh, you know uh, whoever was on the radio the, you know the, the Rolling Stones uh, I just wanted to know how we could sing songs and have Uh, music behind us so we can so I like so I just once I learned chords I was like oh this is great this is guitar playing now I know how to play the guitar and that and so it was really just having fun doing that and uh, it wasn't until a friend of mine actually a, a, a foster kid that was staying with us for a while mm -hmm. who was about uh, he was probably around 16 I was probably more like 11 mm -hmm. and uh, He played guitar and he's, and he's the one who showed me some of these chords and he left uh, at some point and then he came back to visit us like a year later and I said, hey, let's go play guitar. And we did and he did something that changed my world, which is that at, during the middle of our little jam, chord jam, whatever we were doing, um, he, he, went, he did something like this. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa stop, what was that? <laughs> And he said, well, you know, I just, I just bent. Uh, and I said, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. You know, prior to that, I never even heard lead guitar. I didn't know anything about it, even though it was in front of me on the radio and stuff. I, I, it wasn't, I was always about songs with me, mm -hmm. just songs, good songs, big Beatles fans, huge, uh, Steve, you know, Stevie Wonder fans, and a lot of funk, Sly and Family Stone and, And th that blows my mind because how do you go? How do you go from bending a string to jumpstart? Right. <laughs> well, then I got into the guitar because once I once I discovered the bending thing, I inadvertently stumbled across pentatonic scales, and they were just shapes. They were a little more horizontal than the classic that thing, but it was more like. Yeah. If I'd hear a song on the radio, and if the song was doing something like. I go, oh, that's the key right here. And I kind of knew, oh, okay, so I can go. Yeah. So I didn't really take lessons. I had no idea what I was doing. It was just completely guided by my ear. Mm -hmm. And then that led to, you know, getting some 
couple little like starting to get my you know two finger speed going a little bit mm -hmm. and then uh and then it was led zeppelin because that was you know jimmy page at that time was the king of electric guitar for rock yeah and to me it was and, it, and you know i still love him to this day um but then i started to discover some other licks that he was doing and and i figured and i was starting to learn Zeppelin tunes and Zeppelin leads and Jimmy Page leads and it wasn't really super difficult So I started to think well, he's the greatest rock guitar player on the planet and I'm kind of able to do this yeah. So maybe I'm like the second best or something <laughs> um, and it wasn't until uh, Van Halen came out That really I became serious because up to that point the guitar was something fun to do after school once in a while mm -hmm. it wasn't um, I wasn't serious about it and I wasn't really, it was just something to do occasionally. But mm -hmm. when Van Halen came out, I remember thinking um, that there are things that he's playing that aren't possible. Mm -hmm. There's, that's impossible. Like, I remember, tapping. yeah, I didn't know it was tapping. And back then, nobody knew that, right? And yeah. all the tablature books had these, these uh, intervallic things, yeah. you know, they had them spelled out like, right, like, like, or, or, and I was trying to figure out things like, you know, just looking for any way to do it. And I actually took classical guitar lessons for a summer because everyone said he was using the right hand. So I, his fingers on his right hand. So I just figured, oh, so he's doing this. He's doing a flamenco, which I can't do at all, but obviously. Um, but I thought that's what he was doing. And I need to learn that. And so I took lessons for a summer. Um, I had a really cool teacher, younger guy. He was probably in his mid to late twenties, and he loved me because I was into rock and I loved Van Halen. And I was in it. You know, we'd always had these sessions where we talk about Hendrix and Page and Clapton, and, uh, hmm. and then he could actually play Eruptions, sort of. Um, but you know, even then, I remember thinking, okay, you know, that's cool. It doesn't really sound the same but he could do it with the fingers and he could do yeah. it pretty much at that speed. But um, well, he, was playing, he was playing the notes, but he wasn't playing it with the correct, uh, with the correct expression. Exactly. The expression yeah. was different. It was not the same. And even though I, my ears were much younger and not as developed, there was mm -hmm. something instinctually telling me, I don't think that's quite what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So I uh, eventually got to go to a concert with some friends of mine <clears throat> and Van Halen had played at, I think Nassau, Coliseum in New York and nosebleed seats, nosebleed seats. And I brought my binoculars in, in, in <laughs> the and all I wanted, honestly, because I take, to be totally honest with you, I was not a huge fan of the band. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I thought I, at that time I did, you know, I didn't really get the music. I thought it was kind of dated and not all that. I just thought the guitar player was really, I got to know what he's doing. And I, um, And then within like the first 40 seconds of their of them coming on stage, you know, he whips out one of his young know, classic Van Halen shit. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. I couldn't wait to get home because I knew that I knew how to play eruption. I, and they dropped me off at my house like three o'clock in the morning, ran upstairs and you know. So it was like that. And then, and I was the first kid on the block, so to speak that cracked the code, you know, mm -hmm. no one else that, you know, we're going back to 79, you know, 80 ish. And, uh, no, and I was from a small town, so no, nobody was really knowing what was happening. And so I was the first guy really in the area that cracked that code. And then I was like, this is the coolest thing in the world. And, and plus Eddie was so cool and he looked cool. And, and then, um, then I started to listen a lot more to him. And so, I kind of got pulled into music seriously by just simply becoming such a fan of Van Halen. Mm. And once I got in there and really started to see the fretboard and learn about music and learn about how notes put, are put together and learn more about harmony, then I started to get pulled in the direction of other types of players. Like, you know, my, my tiny dip into the jazz side of things was probably Larry Carlton because he, he had an appeal that was, um, that was broad, you know what I mean? You didn't have to be a, a Coltrane 
freak yeah. to, to appreciate him. You could, you know, it was cool. It was just cool, easy listening music. He's very with, sophisticated and yet very expressive. He, he, it's, yeah. it's, it's not difficult to play what he's playing, but he, he, pulls, he pulls those outside notes out of nowhere. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. And the tone is beautiful. And then that led to Robin Ford, which was like, oh my God, this is, no, you know, then, and then, it, you know, and then Schofield and then Pat Metheny and uh, not necessarily in this order, but, you know, Lee Rittenauer. And at the same time, these other rock guys coming out, some George Lynch and, and Yngwie Malmsteen. And so my thing was always that I was, uh, I was never pulled into a genre. I was always just fascinated by all these different guitar players. Mm -hmm. So a typical day for me as a, as a, as an 18 year old kid was, you know, I'm listening to Van Halen from 11 o'clock till one o'clock in, you know, in the afternoon. And then after that, I'm, I'm going and I'm listening to Pat Metheny and Lyle Mays. And then after that, uh, I'm listening to a, some George Lynch solo. And one of the things, and I think the thing that happened with me gradually was that I always felt in my mind that similar to, I think what you were asking or in the, in the, vicinity of it might help to start addressing some of your question was uh why i, I, I always ask myself why is it like ingbe comes out and he's got this amazing unbelievable technique and you're just like oh my god what how is it that's insane and there's all this fire attached to it and all this it's just energy and and fire and and i'd always think to myself but i never lo really liked that music to me the music was like I just didn't, you know, that, you know. I'm so happy that you're saying it instead of me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, if I might venture, I guess, was, was the, I mean, the musical, um, everything you're saying makes sense. I mean, now suddenly I can hear all those. And yeah. it's, it's something that I, uh, that I, keep, uh, I keep telling my students, I keep t saying it on Lick and Riff, that a good musician just takes from everywhere. If you listen yeah. to one genre of music, you will be a one genre player. And yes. if, you want to, if you want to really find your voice and find what you like, you need to listen to um, as much music as possible. I mean, yes. I'm, I'm the guitar player I am because of all, the, of all my students who always right. requested, requested uh, songs and, and, and fingerstyle pieces that I never knew of. That, right. I, that I never learned of. So I became a player that I never imagined myself to be. So. Um, now I can suddenly hear the, the, the effect of everything you're saying. But what I'm wondering about is you have some signature techniques that, um, that are so ingenious. And I think that they make, they make the playing. Your, uh, for example, your, um, your legato playing. It's, it's incredible. And, and oh, you, use a lot, you use a lot of tapping. Sometimes, yes. Yeah, and yeah. How, how, do you, how, did, how did you come about that? How did you come about the tapping scales and all those huge intervals? You're using, you're using huge intervals. Yes. Um, and I, although I, I can see how that would be awesome, just tinkering around with, you know, jamming with yourself with a backing track, yeah. you actually write music with that. Right. How, how, do you approach, how do you approach writing your instrumentals? Because your, your, your first album and, and your second album, for example, they had such a huge style change. Yeah. The first was more metal oriented and the second was more jazz fusion oriented. And that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, introspection used a lot of those, uh, those two-handed techniques, right? Yes. Yes, they did. And, and even on the first album, but you have to remember that two things. So because I was such a Van Halen fan, we had a band after I got out of high school, all that played throughout the eighties. Mm -hmm. Um, the Van Halen thing became so easy for me finally. Mm -hmm. It was just, I, that's how I played. I, I actually sound, I could sound exactly like him with vibrato and everything. Like I knew every one of those solos. And, but towards the mid to late eighties, I, I was really, I literally saying to myself, I need to, I need to break away and find my voice. It was really important to me. And that's always been more important to me than anything. The biggest compliment I could get in the world is when someone says, I heard 10 guitar players on an album today and you jumped right out. I knew it was you immediately. There was no, I heard you immediately. Yeah, uh, there's, no mistaking, when, there's no mistaking your sound and there's no mistaking right. Schofield sound. You, you know right. that, you know that, um, that um, 
famous recording by Guthrie Govan when he, where he recorded in the styles of 50 famous guitar players. I think I've seen, I don't know if I've heard it, but I think I've seen that video. The, I think the only guitar players he couldn't imitate, that you could hear that it wasn't them, were you and Schofield. Ah, I see. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so well, I remember uh, when, I, when I got, so first of all, Mike Varney's label, Shrapnel, at that time was exclusively heavy metal. Mm -hmm. There was an Al Jarreau song that I had sent as part of, uh, it wasn't a song, but it was a I stole the chorus from some really jazzy kind of almost, uh, I don't know, really jazzy tune. That, and, and so when I sent my demo to him, he was not getting a metal version of me. He was getting a hint of that with my soloing, but he was, he was getting some jazzy stuff. And he's the one who said to me, I like your playing, but this is a heavy metal label. So if we're gonna do an album with you, I need some aggressive, in your face, distortion guitar mm -hmm. that sounds like, you know, that in the spirit of that angst, you know, pushing the envelope of guitar kind of thing. So I had to actually go out of my way a little bit to, you know, recharge that engine because I, I, I was already looking in the direction of an introspection type of record, even when I got signed. Mm -hmm. But I probably seriously wasn't ready for it yet. Um, I was still learning. I was still developing. I still hadn't discovered some magical things that really changed my playing, like the whole concept of superimposing. But, um, and I had a lot of practice with the Van Halen-esque you know, thing because we had a cover band that did so much of that. So I knew, I kind of knew what he wanted on that first album. And I was very happy that he wanted me to not be just another guy doing the neoclassical thing. Mm -hmm. So, because at that point he had a bunch of them, right? And they were all great at it. He had the Vinnie Moores and the Tonys, McAlpine and Paul Gilbert, and Yngwie and, <clears throat> and, and Jason Becker. And they were all m masterful at that. And, to, and so I, I was worried because I thought I wouldn't even get signed because I figured you have to know how to do that. So I was really happy that Mike said to me, <clears throat> I'd like you to not do that. And I'd like you to do something that's more bluesy, more, you know, just kind of straight ahead rock, almost like a more of Steve Morsey kind mm -hmm. of feel in, t in terms of composition. Yeah. So um, the very first song that I wrote on that album was a song that I couldn't play. So really part of my technique was developed as an artist who was looking for ways to do things that I, you know, that I couldn't do conventionally. So it's kind most of, like of the a shortcut. Yes. Most of the things that I am known for as being unique mm -hmm. were not my attempt at being innovative. They were my attempt at having a, a solution mm -hmm. to my weaknesses, <laughs> to my shortcomings. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> You know, I was a huge Holdreth fan, and I just figured, how, how is there no pick attack? Yeah. Where, where's the pick? So I would, t no matter what I tried, I couldn't get that. But um, when I started to, because I had so much tapping experience, I started to just screw around with it. And it became really, like, I, I, so I remember thinking one day, I, this is pretty cool. I, this is not that hard. Why is nobody else doing this? This is cool. Um, and then it became like, well, if I can do this, then what, couldn't I just... Or... I, can, I mean, you can just do anything, right? If you're diminished... So it just seemed like a really easy way and really easy fix to getting that shrapnel, uh, you know, yeah, stamp. You're not, you're, not supposed, you're not supposed to get the carpal tunnel syndrome trying to play your favorite music, right? That's another thing I've said to my students for many years. It's like guitar playing should be fun. It should not be exactly. something that's yeah. a, you know what I mean? It should be fun for you. So if you're, if yeah. you're struggling with something and you're unhappy because you can't do something that you wish you could do, then either change your goal or find a way to do it that makes it happy or that makes it fun. Because if you're out there and you see it sometimes on the faces of guitar players, right? You see them on stage and you see that serious face and that they're like, mm, here comes that part. I better, it's like, are you having any fun, my friend? Because 
I'm sure that all those hours you spent in your bedroom, you know, at your, your parents' house, yeah. your goal was to have fun. That's why you did it. So if you're looking at this thing as a big obstacle, uh, that's why I really have a lot of respect for people that find themselves. And, you know, even if it's I, I, some of my favorite, you know, how do you get like a, how do you get a guy like um, or the, the Sly guy, my, my favorite, you know, um, oh, I can't think of his name. Um, it'll come back to you, I think. It'll come back to me. Yeah. yeah. There's actually a video of him with B.B. King and John Mayer, and it's called The Greatest guitar, Slide Guitar Solo Ever. Anyway, you know, he's not a note guy. He's not a shred guy. But, and yet, he just blows my mind. And... Uh, Ry Cooter, maybe? No, no. Um, I know you know who he is. I could find it in two seconds. Oh, sure. I can't believe I can't think of his name. He's huge. You're on the spot, so of course, you're, you're, that's what happens. That's what it is, exactly. Um, yes. And people watching this interview are going to be like, they're all yelling the name. <laughs> you know who I'm well, talking about. And they're all like, yeah, Greg Howe was struggling too. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and w while, you're, uh, while you're searching, um, I just want to tell you, the Licken Rippers, uh, um, you don't have to listen to me, listen to the master. Uh, always have fun. Fun is the number one goal while playing. Yeah, that, that's why I always say, I don't, personally, I, um, I'm i not a performer. I, I never wanted to be a performer. Um, I, I love understanding the music, right. uh, you know, breaking the code and understanding what's going on and understanding how to reach a next level and how to help students reach the next level. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a, an intellectual kind of guy. I, I, I don't... I mean, I can play, my finger style playing is pretty advanced, but I, 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 don't, I don't like performing so much. Okay. So I always stress that um, because my technique, I feel that it would be hypocritical to talk about perfect technique if my technique isn't 100% perfect. Right. But hearing it from someone, you know, whose technique is 100% perfect, uh, <laughs> you, could, you know, it's, it's fun first, music first, and then the technique, the technique comes That's exactly right. Because if you're having fun, the technique would come. I mean, you, yeah. the, the ability would come, it, the muscle memory, everything, it would fall into place one day. Of course, I, you know, when you watch a, one of those like amazing first person shooter gamer expert, yeah. we're back. Um, you know, these, these, some of these amazing gamers who become so good that they win $50,000 in these competitions. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I got into gaming a little bit for a minute. And, and so it's like you have a keyboard and then you have a mouse and you can control your movements here and then you control other movements like this way. These guys are not practicing. They're not doing, okay, let me do that jump twist again. Let me do that jump twist again. Oh, not quite. They're just in there playing a lot. Exactly, yeah. And having a good time. And, and they're just, it's so much fun to them that they just keep playing. So, of course, it's like if a guy loves typing, and he's going to get fast at it finally because it's just doing it all the time. So you're absolutely right. You don't, that's why I, I noticed that uh, one of the questions I think that's probably coming is what's my practice routine. I really don't have one. I don't practice. You just because play. You um, just play. I want to have fun. Yeah. I don't want this. Once this starts to become something that I feel like a little bit of a slave to, um, then I think it's time to move on to some other aspect of, of the music industry as his career because my only goal is to have fun you know that's it that's you know um so i really that's I, why I you're that's, oh sorry sorry for, for cutting you up no 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 yeah um, i mean and that that's that's why you have reached that level in my opinion i mean you can't reach those heights unless you're having fun yes i think you so can't. you just can't you, you see you see so many guitar players on YouTube, I, I keep um, I keep telling people um, they ask who my favorite YouTuber guitar players are, and they're always surprised that it's people nobody knows because because I prefer listening to the people who make mistakes, whose sound isn't perfect, who yeah. play from the heart. Because, well, exactly. yeah, absolutely. Some open strings, a couple of you know bends that maybe didn't quite make it, but you're, you know it's all coming from a sincere place. Yeah, and I, and this kind of goes back, and I know we're jumping around a little bit, but um, you know, when I, when I did my first album and I had to literally, I came up with techniques 
that because I, you know, e even the song um, Kick It All Over, yeah. I heard the melody, uh, which was, um, you know, uh, what key is that in? Yeah, it's like. And I heard, and then, and I'm like, I can't play this. I hear it. Someone, this has to get played somehow, but I couldn't, I couldn't do a convention. I remember trying like, and I'm like, so I literally just started playing around with, oh, look at this. Ah. So I started to learn this uh, this idea that like oh you have an ar you have a, an arpeggio like a triad arpeggio and there's an the inversion of it. Oops. What key am I oh, so I could just tap the inversion. So I just started to see these two different shapes. And I thought to myself, again, this is really easy and it's a great solution. And I, it's really weird to me that no one has done this yet. Oh. Um, so then suddenly I could write, suddenly I could play the song that I wrote. So, so, so you're visualizing, actually, you're visualizing the inversion. Yes, I started it's seeing- Kind of like with, with harp harmonics, where you visualize what you're playing, Right. Twelve frets up. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You're you actually visualizing the other, the other inversion. That's exactly right. That's all it is. Right. It's just literally. Here's the one, and then here's the other one. Right. And so you just tap the notes for the you, other inversion. Do you sometimes uh, envision like two inversions forward, or it doesn't sound? Or it doesn't. Yeah, sound I have done that, especially it's, it, with diminished. Um, there was a uh, song that I did on on an album that I kind of regret doing called "Ascend," but um, uh, there was a lit a riff that I did on there that I, I don't remember how to play it. It was something like a, it was diminished. I don't even remember how I played it, but the concept was more like if this is diminished and this is the inversion, you know, that kind of thing. Then you could go to the next one instead. Something like that. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, I've, I've messed around with it. But really, I'm not, again, those things are not, um, I'm not trying to blow minds as much as I am trying to figure out what, how can I get what I hear here to come out of my speaker cap. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so a lot of, you know, when people will ask me, what do you do when you're improvising? When, it, when it's, you know, I do a lot of remote recordings where someone will hire me to record on their album, but I do the same thing I do on my album. I listen to the solo section for a while and then I start, the first thing that happens when I'm about to record a solo is I take this and I put it down and it goes right here because I don't want to be at all influenced or dictated by my shapes, familiar shapes or the limitations of the guitar. I don't want to see that. I just want to know what I hear. So then I start hearing things and I start saying, oh, if I was the great solo, if I was listening to this song and the solo came on, I would want it to go you know, I'm hearing it in my mind mm -hmm. and it starts to construct itself in my mind a little bit. And then when I pick up the guitar and I try to see what that looks like or, okay, so if I keep that theme or that strategy, mm -hmm. what does that look like? What does that start to look like? So I really, and sometimes it's weird. Sometimes it's like, oh, wow, I'm hearing stuff that I'm not sure that I can do it. I don't know if I know how to do what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I will expand sometimes because it's like, well, I know I'll probably hear this again at some point, so I need to figure out how to do this so that the next time it shows up in my mind, I've got something ready for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really 
what I always encourage people to do is instead of letting your fingers dictate what you're going to do, uh, ignore the limitations of the guitar and just go by what's in your mind and then figure out something. There's always a solution somehow with enough, you know, and, and make it a fun game. You know, how could I do this? Hmm. Yeah, the guitar is such a versatile instrument that, that really is. almost any sound is possible. It's, it's like if you play uh, one of my favorite sounds, I, just, I don't know how I discovered it, by, probably by accident. I was playing harmonics and, and the sound was, and, and the, the volume uh, knob was down. So, so I played the harmonics and opened it and suddenly it sounded like woodwind instruments. Ah, yeah. yeah so, so you can get that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I think that, that, and that's why I tend to gravitate towards guitarists who really have really unique voices. Because you can tell that they were, that, that they got there by way of just having a good time. It's a, it's a childlike, you know, I, 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 when I get into more advanced students that I have sometimes, and I'll notice, okay, here's a backing track, go ahead. And depending on what they might be working on, chord, or maybe we're focusing on 16th notes, whatever it is, but they, they'll start playing, and I can see their brain at work. They're doing all this cool stuff, and it's like, okay, got this lick, do this now, here's my 16th note, here's my wide interval thing. And, and, and then I'll sometimes I'll stop them and say, what, what would you do if you weren't, if you didn't know any of these shapes, or you didn't know, know what mm -hmm. would you do in your mind if you could, what would a kid do? You know, sometimes you can, a child, where's that childlike spirit that's just gonna, you know, be like, how come I've been listening to you play for the last four minutes and not one time have I heard you just take a note and bend it, hit it six times in a row. Have fun, you know, make some, just be creative and, and not, don't be so, student, you know, it doesn't have to be so scholastic. Have some fun, hit a whammy bar, you know, uh, do a trill, you know, do, do stuff that, that you're not gonna learn from Berkeley College. Just have fun, get in there and be creative. And sometimes it, it, one of the exercises we'll do with, what I'll do with guys is I'll say, I, I want you to play a guitar solo and, and you can't do any, you, can't, you cannot go outside of one string. You can use only one string and you gotta be creative. Be as creative as you can be. Um, I don't want you to play anything but double stops for the next two minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you confine yourself to these, these limitations on purpose, it forces you to be, to have to really reach for creativity. You're not reaching for creativity when you're just seeing a shape that you know you can play nicely through. Exactly, yeah. You know, a lift that you've practiced a bunch of times. That's not reaching for creativity. That's just being dictated by your own muscle memory. Yeah. Reaching for creativity means to sometimes put yourself in a box that forces you to have to be cool, you know? Regarding something you said earlier, um, did you, um, can we have five more minutes? Um, oh, whatever, man. I'm having a good time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, me, me too. Me too. Um, um, ADHD. I, I lost my, <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, uh, Derek trucks, by the way, was the, was the guy, Derek trucks. Derek trucks. Yeah. Monster. Yeah. Ah, uh, can't be Derek trucks. Right. <laughs> with a slide. Um, you, you earlier, you, um, you said that you take the guitar off and you listen to the, you listen to the album, you listen to the backing track and you, you sang ideas. Do you record yourself singing and then transcribe what you sang? Or do you have a general idea and then try to transcribe it? Because when I try to transcribe what I hear in my head without recording myself sing, my hands fall back to, to what they know. I need, I need to hear myself sing the idea and then transcribe it. I see. No, I guess when I say um, listen to it a few times, what ends up happening is not something specific. When I'm singing a solo in my mind, and I listen to that same solo section again, it's not necessarily the same exact way every time. It's just that there seems to be a theme that, that feels like it's forming. Like, in other words, this feels like a solo that should start in the high register and mm. then work its way down. Or this feels like a, a solo that should start with a double stop bend. That's, you know, like it, this feels like a solo that wants to, and then it feels, in other words, the storyline in general 
starts to form, you know, introduce the characters here, you know, you know, have this thing happen, have it the climatic moment here and then fade it out there. Uh, this should end, I feel like it should end on a high note, or I feel like it should end by a, with a descend. Um, it just, it's more of a general theme that I, I start, that just starts to happen on its own mm -hmm. when I'm listening over and over again. So it's not like I'm actually trying to play something specific. It's more like I'm trying to find the storyline that seems like it would be most mm -hmm. that I would connect to easiest. And that's more, that's, that's coming from me. Yeah. So it's not a specific thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. it's so I, I, Speaking of specific, I do have a specific question. And sure. I'm, really, I'm really glad that you played it because I wanted to ask you this and, and I would have forgotten unless I saw you play it. Um, that slide vibrato that you're doing. Yeah. Is another it, thing. It, it, another thing. Oh, again, same exact um, thing. I, I was doing my first album with Mike Varney and we were in the studio. It was kind of intimidating back then because, you know, he would sit right in front of me like this, like literally his knees coming up almost to mine and he'd be controlling the recorder. Right. So back then it's like you do the, you do the, the drums and the bass, you record the rhythm tracks, then you do the rhythm guitar on another day and then you do the melodies. And then the very last final day or last couple of days is all for solos. Mm -hmm. He'd sit there and, uh, and then he'd be controlling the, the record and the stop button and everything. And uh, it was, it was kind of, it was kind of a strange, awkward situation. And what was your question? Now I'm, I'm getting myself the, off. Uh, the slide. Oh, of right. So there was a lick. I don't remember what the lick was. It was some, I'm sure probably shred oriented lick. Uh, I'll just, you know, whatever it was. You know. And I, every time I'd go for the vibrato, it wasn't aggressive enough for him. He wanted it more like, nah, I want that to really, you know. And uh, so I, I, I don't know what made me think to do this, but I, I, I just decided like to do that. I mean, we kept punching just this one note. It was just like, and um, I remember he got, ah, oh, that's it. You know, he got all excited. And I thought to myself, really? And I started to, you know. And it just had a soulful, one of the things I love about great soul singers and is that when you listen to them, um, there's a hesitation before that vibrato comes. Right. Even with a ballad, it's, it's like a lot of times metal guitar players will, will almost, they'll always have the instant, like instant vibrato, right. rather than, you know, letting it fade in a bit. And so even with the slide vibrato, there's a hesitation. It sits there for a split second. And just out of curiosity, is it, is it always two frets forward or, is it, or, or does it change according to your mood? I mean, I, this is a great question and I've been asked it so many times on uh, clinics and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I finally literally paid attention and, and did a, a, you know, literally did a, an inquiry to see what, what's happening. And what I discovered is that I think it's a, it's about a minor third above the note and about a half step below it. So it's more sharp than flat. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about it, all vibrato, that's done that way is only sharp. That's only the original note plus the note above it. Unlike our violin. So if you watch close, yeah. 
yeah, I mean, so that's the natural place where it seems to be the most soulful. Every time I look at it, it's like slow motion sounds horrible because it's like. <laughs> but it's an illusion yet that's why the note has to sit there for a split second so that the ear believes in in, in that initial place that it landed so I see other guys who are see a lot of guys doing that now and some people are really good at it I, sometimes I hear sometimes it seems a little uh, lazy and slow like so in other words i'll see guys sometimes go uh that's just sort of a it's it's just and then it, there's a thin line between that and right they're very similar but one sounds like just nonsense and the other one yeah because you have to focus on the music and the rhythm instead of focusing on the slide Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, the ear has to guide you. the bedroom. Right, that's exactly right. Yeah, the ear has to guide the thing. Um, but again, it's just another example of um, what I would call wishing that I could have been able to do things conventionally, but then in the in the end, feeling like it was a blessing that I couldn't. Right. Yeah. I mean, it could be, it could almost be a curse <laughs> that you're so good that you can do everything really well. Uh, because it it's harder to go reach for something. It's harder to go find a new place to be. What what are you, for example, what what are you uh, aiming for now? Is there something that you're working on right now? Is that to to get to ingrain into your sound something new, or or are you happy where you are? Which is great. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. Um. um I think that what is sort of subconsciously or subtly creeping up in my desires, uh, you know, my goals as part of my goals is, is to say more, honestly, to say more with less stuff, to make bigger statements with less words. Mm -hmm. You know, when you listen to the great statements by, you know, over the years by Shakespeare or these great people, it's always a few words that make, that's like, wow, how did you figure out how to say all that with like that? How did you do that? <laughs> I mean, so, um, and, the, and honestly, some of the guitar players that just blow my mind are these guys that are, I've heard so many ridiculously talented technique guys mm -hmm. that, um, but I think I'm with you that if that, but if that's not coming with a true desire to convey an emotional you know, to, to convey emotion and to if it's not if it's not musically justified, and it, right, it, you're right, and and even I would even say, I don't mind if something doesn't sound musical on a guitar as long as it moved me in some way. Yeah, yeah, move me somehow. Yeah, make me feel it because if you're just trying to impress me, mm -hmm. you had me at the, at the first two seconds. Yeah, but I'm not. I didn't show up here to be impressed. I showed up to to be affected in some way to be moved, to be, um, to have some kind of abstract conveyance of information that, that I mean, I, I know something about you now that I didn't know before and I can't put it into words, but I can feel it. Mm -hmm. um, that's not happening with a guy that's just showing me what his capabilities are, you know, that, yeah. and so that's, that drives everything that I do because uh, otherwise, what's the point of this? What are we doing this for? Like. Right. What, I mean, what makes us love a Beatles tune? What makes us love a uh, Stevie Wonder tune? Or, what, or whatever you're into, a dream theater, you know? Or, it, it's, the, it's the whole thing. It's, it's not just because one part was really impressive, you know? It's because collectively there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a conveying of information that's, that's where the person is giving you a part of himself. That's some. That's something that I that I actually that I actually noticed uh, about your albums. Um, you know, as opposed to most guitar-oriented albums, um, with your albums, the the 
the the the rest of the group the the drums um, have you have su superb drummers on your albums and they, they just you can listen to your albums and just ignore you you can yeah. you, you can listen to the drums you can listen to when I uh, listen to um, button up and go I think that's the blues right uh, but yeah. it's one yeah. of my favorites uh, it's it's so lyrical and so melodic, and yet sometimes when I listen to uh, Button Up and Go, I listen to the bass player. Absolutely. And there's so much soul, and all he's doing is dun, 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 and you just get lost in that. Yes, and I've said that for years. I've always said, um, I don't, you know, the, the lead guitar is the icing on the cake. The, 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 what I'm here to give you is music. Yeah. I'm here to make you, I don't want, I don't, I'm not playing as much for the eight guitar players in the front row as I am for their girlfriends. I want, I want someone, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want non-musicians to, I want to know that if I break a string and I have to walk off stage, that, that there's still a good song happening. Yeah. So the lead guitar is the last thing for me. I, I don't design songs around my lead playing. I design songs around what I would want to hear. And then I say to myself, I want this song to be great if there's no guitar on it. And now that I feel good about the song, let's see what happens if I sprinkle the final spice on, which is some soloing. It's, it's a distant, distant second to the song. And I can hear guitar players who write music based around their technique and based yeah. around. And I'm not saying that that's wrong or that I, I'm not judging it. I'm just saying I come from the exact opposite place of that. You have, you have a song in your head and you just want to describe it, to, to express it. Yes. The music you, is you write all the parts, right? Or do you work with the, the, the musicians to, they, you write it together, or do you write all the parts of the, the instrumentals? I generally write all the parts. Um, however, um, it's, it would be like, you know, if I, if I wanted you to, to give me a classical piece on, on you know, or in, in have you included on the song with, with some cool picking thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to do what you do. So I, I might have a section where on a demo, I present something that's kind of like what I'm looking for, but I'm going to allow you to, to say, okay, I know what Greg's going for. Mm. I know what he wants. So I'm going to do it like this. So yes, I'll, if I give something to Dennis Chambers or, uh, you know, some bass player, They'll, it'll often come back considerably different, yeah. But the foundation of the of the idea, the premise, still remains. You know, I want their, I want your signature on this. I want to hear you do, you yeah. doing my my idea. I don't want you to do my idea. Otherwise, why are you here? I could do that. And yeah, I, I I don't want you to do my idea my way. I want you to do my idea your way. Uh, that's that's that, that's great, and that's that's why yeah the, you, you hear the you you, you he, the fun oozes out of the, the yeah. record. Yeah. <laughs> it's really important to me. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's uh, I sometimes like it when people say to me, um, I don't know what it is about your music, Greg. There's something about it, but when I hear it, I just you know it just it make it's it's warm and it makes me want to smile. Yeah, and it, that's I love that. You know, it's, I'm not you know. I'm not saying every song is like that, but that those are the things that really compliment me much more. Those are the things that make me, those are the compliments that make me feel great <clears throat> much more so than, you know, dude, you're fucking best ever, you know, that's <laughs> nice. But um, I just like to know that I'm affecting people. Yeah, I mean, when, when I, because um, why, why do I keep, uh, do I keep, telling people to, you know, that they should listen to your music if they want to hear what a guitar can really do. I, I, it's because, it's because you, you use the same tools we all do. You, you, yeah. you know, you play major scales, minor scales, pentatonic scale. Sometimes, right. sometimes you do go outside, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you do use the pentatonic scale uh, as sure. a main tool, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, even though you use all those outside sounds and everything, you still use the pentatonic scale to achieve that. Yes. Some, sometimes, right? Many, probably more often than not. Yeah. Yeah, because the the, the and and the it, it always saddens me that people are not aware of what the pentatonic scale can do. 
that by moving it around and, and creating different positions on the scale, you can even get the altered scale out of it. Absolutely, you can. Yeah, yeah it's a great trick is to go up three, go up a minor third yeah. Yeah. and play uh, the altered scale. You're ten, like it's on a two, five, one, you can actually... It helps to be in tune on a, on a televised interview. Um, um, but it's nice, it's a fun trick to go play, you know, so I'm playing the fifth above uh, pentatonic, so I'm using A minor. Which is nice, because and the nine comes out. And then you, you, you go to like an alt, your, your G, if you make it altered, or even if you don't, and you say to yourself, all right, well, the big, the big trick that most of us know is that you can go up a half step. Yeah. and play the altered or play the melodic minor scale which makes it altered for the key that you supposed to, you know, G altered in this case yeah but if you look at this shape you can see the pentatonic scale hiding right in there so you can really go like And you can actually go up again to get that if you wanted to get like the Lydian. I can't, this is like ridiculous. I really apologize to you listeners. <laughs> I'm usually in tune. You have absolutely nothing to apologize for, Greg Howe. <laughs> Is it, so do you do you use these do you use these uh, tricks a lot when you when you solo and you uh, you go outside and back in again? Do you just take the, the, the thing, like I half do. a step and? I do I do sometimes and one of the things I do a lot um, is I imagine a five chord. Mm -hmm. So even if I had like a um, just a normal just, let's say just a, I'm at a jam session we're doing just a. So sometimes I might, um, so two, a couple things for the, for the quick, easy way to be out to sound more, you know, to not sound like I'm, I came from the, the world of ACDC as a kid, <laughs> uh, <laughs> would be that this, all this stuff starts to maybe become a little bit more. So I'm basically introducing melodic minor, or I'm just taking my what would used to be a Dorian scale and turning it into right that right away. So we're getting at major seventh, which just sounds sounds like you are cool. It sounds like you you know something that other people don't know. I mean, I think but, I think if, I think if you sound like you're cool, then you're cool. You're, you know. <laughs> right. But then the other trick is that I'll play to the imaginary five, like in every few bars. You know, I'll just imagine. And then so I can, and if I do that, I've got my, and then in my mind, right? So you heard my, the altered sound that might have been played over that. Uh, or maybe even, um, I'm trying to think of a better example. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'll do. So, uh, so it just, and then, but that chord's not there. So you just imagine that the A stays there. And then every now and then you'll hear, So the ear goes, that was weird sounding, it, but yet there's something that kind of sounds logical. So you superimpose, so you're superimpose the E over the, the A over the, the D? Yeah, superimposing an imaginary uh, E altered chord. Over, over A. Over A, yes, every now and then. Yeah. Uh, and it gives me, um, it just gives me the, uh, it gives me an out sound. There's also a lick that I practically stole. If you have the soundproof album, 
uh, there's a lick that was so heavily influenced by Schofield on there that I used three times on that record. And it is not exactly ripped off of him, but it's really close. It's, it's close enough that like if he wanted uh, some, some money for royalties, I, I'd be willing to discuss that with him. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, he does this, he does on one of his, I've, I've heard him do a lot of this a few times where if you imagine that, uh, I'll play it slow. Two, three, four. Right. <laughs> yeah. So he'll go like, uh, he'll be like. It's a great sound. Uh, I don't think he fingers it that way, but I just love the sound of it's like half altered. Um, it's half sort of a sidestep thing. Cause you know, you could just go. Sorry. Where I just went up a half step. Yeah. Or. Hard to explain it, but I'm just, but he's actually doing a little bit of that and sort of using the altered sound. Um, it, but his pocket is so insane yeah. that it almost doesn't really matter what he does because he's. Yeah, it's it's, un, it's unimaginable. Did you yeah. did you hear his jam sessions with um, a Desky Martin and Wood? With I'm not sure. I probably yeah. have. But maybe I didn't know. The the album they made, uh, the neo funk thing that they did in. Um, in the 90s uh they started with a go go oh yeah so so they're still so they're still jamming and they're still producing albums and on youtube every now and then they'll upload they, they'll upload a jam session and nowadays suddenly you started doing these insane runs that sound like nothing you've ever heard really? so it's it's just you listen to him run and you say what is that yeah is that, is that he did he discover a new scale a new element yeah. what is that and, and that's Schofield. almost like i don't have those notes on yeah. my guitar <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a it's like an extra fret right he's got an extra yeah it's, yeah no he's um and i was I, you know and i discovered him later because i i got into scott henderson mm -hmm. first because scott you know to me was really cool when i was young because he was obviously jazz trained yeah but he had that rock energy which was the which was kind of like the thing i was always trying to do kind of so i thought wow this guy but his thing leaned more towards jazz yeah. at, at least back then and i listened to him a lot and then when i discovered schofield i thought okay scott i mean i love scott but scott did a lot of listening to schofield yeah uh, a lot of listening yeah. to schofield yeah, he always refers. He always refers to Schofield when he talks about, yeah, when when he when he when he you know you have an, an interview and can you tell us something about uh, odd time signatures? Yeah, well, Schofield used to do this. Right. Yeah, yeah, and and I and I really heard. It. I didn't even know that he said that. I just knew that when I heard Schofield finally, I was like, okay, now I know where Scott got. You know, was heavily influenced. I'm not saying Scott got all his stuff from. No, no of course. really. Scott Henderson is amazing, amazing. Okay. I mean, I, I once tried to learn a Scott Henderson lick, and I and I, I quit midway through it. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, I, I have your I have your transcription book, and I just play a lick every now and then. I can't I can't do any of it. <laughs> <laughs> you could do it. You could do it. It's you know I, I just want to actually I want to summarize some of the stuff that I yeah. you know for people watching. Um, and I do this with my students. I, I say this to my students. If there's anything that I think, and in, in when it when it all is said and done, yeah. that that people will look back and remember about my teaching, and I don't mean it like when I'm gone from the world, but like students that leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's that my goal is always to do not not to be the craziest guitar player with the big stretches and, and it's, it's to have the easiest way to do the things that give you the most. 
-hmm. I want the guitar to be, I want you to sound as advanced as you can with the least amount of work, the least amount of required practice time. And so a lot of these techniques and ideas that I'm doing, I feel like are not really that difficult. They're not, uh, they're, they're more like, it's more just, oh, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. Oh yeah, you could do that, you know? Um, I used to have a thing that I would do with, with rock students who, a lot of students who just had a, if we're working on eighth notes or 16th notes where you want to keep things in time, mm -hmm. and a lot of times you'd hear guys like, very downbeatish, right? Very much like every new part of the sequence starts on the downbeat and so forth. So I, I came up with a, an idea that would force them to have to sound more interesting, force them to have to displace some of those accents. Mm -hmm. the, exercise, the original accent or the original exercise was this thing that was just that, where you go. Or you could alternate the high note and go. With using any shape. You know? And then I'd have these lines that they'd have to do where it might start off bluesy or start off in a familiar shape where they go. And then they have to jump into that. So they have to do something like. And it would force them to suddenly hear themselves doing things that they would never have thought to do. Mm -hmm. And it would actually get their brain to start. Thinking, oh yeah. You know, that's, and that was the attraction of these sort of some of the jazz players was that they have a bebop influence and bebop is more like one of the things about bebop is the displacement, right? So in mm -hmm. other words, um, a rock, a rock, if a rock player is going to go, a jazz guy or a bop influence guy doesn't want all those downbeats to sound. They doesn't want those, those the highest note of the riff to be on the downbeat or the lowest note. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be more something more like, right? Where, where the notes that are being accented are not happening on down music. Like one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a five E. So that's a big thing with me is, is uh, to me it's a sexier sound. It's, it's a yeah. more, it's a less predictable sound. It's more, um, it's not so rigid and it feels like it, like it, like it flows a little more. Mm. All right. Well, I think that's uh, that's so much more information that, that I hope to gather out of this. Oh, man. It's my, my pleasure, man. It's really been fun. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it, it has. And uh, it still is. And uh, I want to thank you so much, uh, you know, if not, not only for agreeing for the interview, it's just also for the openness and the honesty. And, you know, you you. You gave us a lot of material here, and um, and I thank you. It's I thank you, and I, everybody watching, man, really appreciate it. I apologize for my guitar being out of tune and not being warmed up, but uh, if you listen to my albums, it gets it gets a little better than that. <laughs> yeah, his guitar is in tune most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. Right? Yeah, that when you born thing is tr tricky. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, so thank you again. Thank you. I um. It was, it was an absolute pleasure. All right, man. Have a great one. Catch up soon.